Okay, welcome to a mobile garage talk. We're at Blue Competition Cycles talking with their new marketing person, Eric Bruner, who also happens to be a national cyclocross champion. And um, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for being on. And um, just wanted to chat with you, catch up. You're a, uh, a very seasoned veteran, even though you're what, 20? 20... 21. 21. Now. I was going to say 22. 21. And you uh, had a successful uh, victory last year, about a year ago, right? At the National Championships for Cyclocross? Yeah, just under a year ago, I won the, the U23 men's in, uh, out in Seattle, Washington. Okay, so, and when did you, and now you're working for Blue Competition Cycles, which is the bike you ride as a blue, and yep. you're on the blue team, Blue Stages Factory team. What, um, how did you come to be working here? So, my coach and team manager, Grant Holicky, uh is friends with, with Orly, the owner of the company. Those guys go back a ways. And so, that's how we originally got set up riding blue last season. Last season was our first on blue bikes. Okay. And this will be our second now. And so, I got to know Orly a little bit better. And I was just coming out of college. I just graduated this past summer. And so I was talking to Orly last winter, um, and he's like, you know, marketing uh, is, is what we need right now. We're looking to hire somebody to do that, and it just worked out. Huh. How do you like it? I'm having a good time so far. Yeah. Um, I'm about two months in here now, and so I'm getting, getting into the flow of things now and to the point where, you know, I don't have to ask Orly questions every day. <laughs> um, I come into the office a couple days a week, and I do a bit of work from home. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really off on my own, kind of uh, able to be a bit more independent now. So, did you have a marketing degree? Yeah, so I have a degree in business, um, and my area of emphasis when I was studying was marketing. So, I want to get into the cycling part of your life, but I, want to, I'm, I am kind of curious. I can remember some of my first, my first job out of college, and I think you study, you study for four years or whatever, how has the transition been and is working in a real business like you thought it would be? Um, to be honest, it's not the most different. Um, I've always had to do things other than cycling. I've never been a full-on professional cyclist full-time. And so I honestly like having a bit of responsibility out of, outside of cycling. I think it helps me to stay on schedule and just to not get bored and... You know, obviously I have to make money somehow and have a job as well. <laughs> right. And so it doesn't feel a whole lot different than college. I would say the biggest difference is just the independence and open-endedness of a job. You know, yeah, I do have specific assignments like I did in school on one hand, but on the other, I have to decide a lot of the time what I need to do. Do you feel like and things then go you out and do it? So it's, it's a bit more difficult to plan things out or manage my time, but I'm, I'm getting used to it. Did you, are you, do you feel like what you learn in school is very applicable to what you're doing? Oh yeah, I, I feel pretty comfortable in this job and I feel like I had a good idea of, you know, what the responsibilities of the job would be. And so, CU so did a great job of preparing me for, for this, honestly. We did a lot of projects where, you know, in school I've done things like ha had to build a website, I had to, you know, drive traffic to that website and, and you know learn about uh, making real ads or you know how to choose what sort of media you're going to do things like that so it's a it comes pretty naturally yeah well it just seems like an amazing fit for you you grew up in Boulder correct yeah and then you went to see you you raced on blue but you race bikes you race for blue and now you're working for blue it's yeah it's like pretty amazing yeah and I you know I, I didn't think it would be this close with between the sponsorship and my job, but at the same time, you know, I always saw myself working in the cycling industry, or at least the outdoor industry, and so, yeah, I'm glad that it worked out this way. Yeah, it seems awesome. What, talk about your, your growing up, like, were you always a bike racer? Do you play other sports? Tell us about yourself a little bit as a kid. Yeah, so cycling has always been my main sport. Um, my, my parents have done it for quite a long time, uh, not, not professionally, but, um, that's just what we grew up doing, right? Right with my parents and my younger brother. And so I've done a few other sports. Uh, the most serious one that I did was ski racing. I did a few years of uh, both alpine and, and Nordic skiing. Um, 
but I never I never really played any team sports or anything. I've been you know running bike competitively since I was probably ten years old. Hmm. So. So nature and nurture a little bit. I kid, that's your... <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I don't know if I would have gotten into cycling if it weren't for my parents, but at the same time, now looking back, I'm really happy that I did. And, you know, cycling is just a super interesting sport to me. Um, what I like about it is I like how it's kind of both individual and a team sport. I like how there's a huge element of strategy of equipment choice of team tactics um, but also fitness and strength skill all these different things and so I think you can really argue that that cycling is one of the more interesting more complex sports out there we'll, we'll talk about um, before we get into some specifics on cycling talk about just growing up in Boulder and how this community influences the sport of cycling and yourself and, and promote and got you really good maybe well, I'm, I'm lucky to have grown up in Boulder because there's just always been a lot of opportunity here. There's a, you know, a full calendar of road racing, cyclocross racing every year. Uh, I rode for Boulder Junior Cycling for a long time. So it's been really nice to grow up around a lot of people who do not only do the same thing, but are really good at it. Who are some of your sort of like influencers or heroes or people that you've really sort of followed over, the, over your life and who you've kind of inspired you to be? doing what you're doing? That's a good question. Um, one of my earlier coaches on BJC was Ann Trombley. She was a great coach. She's an Olympian, mountain biker. Um, Andy Bajadali, um, who was a professional rider on what's now Rally. Um, he was one of my other coaches growing up. And you know, Pete, Pete Weber uh, was my coach for cyclocross when I was a junior as well. So that's, you know, kind of the, kind of the common theme is as I came to all those people through BJC. And, you know, I got, I got to say my coach now, Grant Holicky as well. He's, uh, you know, while he wasn't a professional rider himself, um, he really understands the world. And I don't think that you have to have been a professional to really know what you're doing and really help people. Uh, who are trying to do that. Was there anybody like a uh, Sagan, Peter Sagan, or somebody on the big big stage that you've really idolized over the years? Um, that's interesting. I don't really think so. I've, I've never been one to, to really idolize or, or fanboy over any particular uh, professional rider. No man crushes out there. Um, I, I do think it is inspiring. Um, just the generation of American riders that I've grown up around and seeing how successful they're becoming. Um, because, you know, honestly, American men's cycling hasn't been the most successful in the past couple decades, you know. So who would that be for you? And so growing up around guys like Gage Hecht mm. or, um, you know, seeing what um, a couple other guys my age now are doing in the world tour, McNulty, Ian Garrison... Um, you know, those guys are the exact same age as me and having, having huge success already. Right. What, what about, um, how did, how did you, what was a kind of an aha, uh, uh, aha moment maybe when you said, this is what I want to really make of my life for, for the next 10, 20 years? You know, I, I've always kind of toyed with the idea of being a professional rider, but you know, for whatever reason, just didn't wasn't super serious about it or didn't really know if it was something I could do or seriously wanted to do, you know, in a, in a realistic way. And so I would say that moment for me probably in part was when I started riding for 303 Project, which is my first, you know, continental team, um, you know, which is another now now gone, but another great local program. Um, probably going to Cyclocross Worlds for the first time when I was a junior. That was another thing that... You that know, was this year, right? Oh, when I was a junior. Oh, junior. was my first oh. time. That was 2016. Oh, okay. And um, probably one of the biggest ones now is just is riding for the Avolo team. And... Uh, you know, Mike, Mike Cree, the director over there, has given me 
a lot of guidance, inspiration, and, and just, you know, taught me a lot about what it, what it will really take to, to make cycling my career. So let's, let's, let's fast, let's go back a year, little, maybe a little more than a year when you haven't raced on the national, you weren't racing in the national scene yet. The race was mm-hmm. still coming up. What was your expectation going into nationals last year? Did you feel like you could win it? Oh yeah. Um, and I, for the last several years, I, I've definitely felt more pressure at nationals just, just for myself, but because I knew I could win. Honestly, the, the first year that I really felt that way was 2017 and, or 2018, the first, the first go around in Reno. And I was second that year behind Chris Blevins, mm. um, which wasn't really a disappointment, but, um, you know, I, I wanted more for sure. Uh, and, but I think that, la- I think that this past year in, uh, 2019, I-, I knew that I could win, but I was just more confident about it. And so... I, I, I felt the pressure, but I was less nervous, I would say. Mm. Take us through that race in Lakewood. How did go, tell us about it from a, maybe somebody's perspective that, well, first of all, probably wasn't there, and maybe doesn't even totally understand cyclocross, just thinks about bike racing. But talk about, talk about that race. That's a good question, because I think you, know, you can really go into any race in as much depth as you want. Uh, so I, I came into that race, I'd done the collegiate race a couple days before and you know won, won it by a good margin. Obviously the competition in that race is nowhere near the same, but it was, it was still a good test. You know, uh, Caleb Swartz was in there, uh, or no, I'm sorry, he wasn't, but he had done the varsity race and I had ridden a bit faster times than him, but you never know, right? It, the conditions can be different. He was not that far off of me. I was racing against uh, Jack Tanner, my my teammate from CU, and and he's, you know, an excellent rider as well. Um, but you know, so many more guys coming into the U23. So I started the race, and on the first lap, honestly, I felt horrible. That was probably one of the worst laps of the whole season. And how'd you feel horrible? Talk, I, that I just had bad legs. Oh, okay. Um, and you know, I I thought back to. Uh, you know, I, I think I was kind of the favorite coming in, um, maybe not as much as, you know, Curtis White in uh, 2017 came to mind when everybody, you know, everybody just thought they knew he was going to win, and he just, I think, cracked under pressure, you know, and I, he was still easily the best rider that year, don't know what happened to him, but I was like, you know, I, I can't go and do that, and so, I, I don't know if I didn't get a great warm-up. You know, I pretty much did this. I did the same warm up that I always do, which didn't seem like a problem. I definitely tried to taper more for that race, as you know, as you do for nationals or any very important race. And as as I train more and and just get more miles in the legs, it's it's actually counterintuitively harder to do that. And the reason is your body just responds in a different way to rest. And so what used, what used to be kind of a nice break, breather, you know, you come back fresh. Uh, when, when, you, when you train that much more, your body just comes in and it, kind of, it can kind of shut down sometimes when you have too much rest. And so my coach and I have been playing with, you know, you know up the volume the day before the race. So, you know, used to do maybe an hour, now I do at minimum 90 minutes, but probably two hours is better. Is this Grant at this point? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, so I worked with him for the past uh, four years Okay. Now. And, you know, just, just more efforts, that sort of thing. Maybe, maybe rather than taking those few days rest, you know, days two, three, and four before the race, it's maybe, you know, you, you end that more like three or four days before the race, and so we do you know, a longer ride two days before, or like, you know, the collegiate race, for example, we weren't worried about that um, making me too tired for the under 23. Anyway, I, I got it together after the after the first lap, or lap and a half. How many laps was it total that day? I, think I would say seven, I think. Seven, okay, so you kind of burned a match. 
Yeah, but, you but know, just it was, the race was still very early. It wasn't like I was really gapped off or anything. Right. But I did have, I was farther back than I wanted. You know, I was sitting in, like, maybe fifth, fifth place early in the first lap when I would, would want to be, you know, first, second, third. Um, so I, I moved up, and I was, you know, I was in the front, like, probably after the first lap or shortly thereafter. I started feeling better. And so I, I, just, I just started riding the race from the front. And I saw that I was riding the descents pretty well. And so what I tried to do was ride those fast, not, you know, nothing crazy, still being patient, but then, you know, you, you would go down a couple of those descents and have a, have a longer pedal section, and that's where I really hit it. And so after, after a few laps, it was, it was me and Caleb Swartz, and about midway through the race, you know, I was trying to put pressure on him, just, just keep turning the screws he he made a mistake um, that opened up a big gap he went down on the last steep descent mm. um, about halfway through the race and that opened up you know 10 15 second gap and you know if you go back and look at the video I think he was just getting tired you know he's a great bike handler but just just nobody is the same when they're fresh as when they're tired right and so um, you know, at that point, it was it was early in the race, and sometimes it's stressful to be on your own that long. Yeah. But, you know, then again, every everybody was on their own at that point, so, you know, I knew that was it, and I just, just it was it's sloppy, just, it's wasn't just, it? It's just a time trial to the finish. Um, oh, not too. Bad. I wouldn't say sloppy, but it was pretty muddy. Yeah. It was, it was pretty muddy. Not nothing like nothing crazy. I also was switching bikes more than a lot of people, and I, you know, mechanicals didn't end up playing a role in that race really but then again I'm not, I'm not trying to take my chances and you know just every every chance you can get to take a clean bike it's not going to lose you time you know wait a minute time out so what do you mean you switch bike like in the middle of the race you switch bikes oh yeah oh yeah I probably switched bikes I don't, four times in the race oh no kidding I yeah. guess I don't I don't recall seeing that at local races where people do that oh well in local races no and now you know now you can't have anybody in the pit so <laughs> if you're switching bikes you gotta go in hang your bike up on the rack get the other one off but you know when you're, when you're switching bikes with a with two mechanics in the pit it, you know you lose maybe one second maybe so if you're riding with somebody else you come in first get the bike you know off huh. the bike for six steps maybe and back on you know you can just hop right back on their wheel do you switch in most races um if it's muddy yeah just to keep it if keep it's, oh yeah yeah but you know it's definitely a tactic to you know some sometimes people will hold out longer because they from switching a bike because they think it'll they're gonna lose time but you know just the just the drivetrain efficiency and the the stress it puts on the bike, you know, the chance of having a mechanical getting, you know, mud in the gears, your shifting is bad, or your your braking is bad, your bars are slippery, your pedals are oh. gunked up, all those all those different things. I'm really feeling bad. I didn't know that was normal. I just uh, <laughs> oh I, yeah oh I, yeah. Actually, another interesting thing. Um, so I was on mud tires the whole day uh, in the U23, but in the collegiate, I was I was rode the intermediate uh, to start. And once I had a once I had a good gap, I switched to mud tires for the last two laps. You know, I just want to play it safe. Okay. Because it was, it wasn't dry. It was a bit muddy, but it was you know it was kind of one of those borderline things. And so, I think of what a lot of people tend to do is they ride. They're too cautious. They ride too aggressive of a tread, and you know you're losing. You know, in the double digits of watts, probably at least on the faster sections. So you so it's like a tennis player walking into their courts with like ten different rackets. So you describe oh, sure. what you take to a race for when you switch. You get like three or four bikes. You got five, six wheel sets, or how well, do you do all that? So last season I was on two, just had two bikes. Okay. Um, and probably had a half dozen sets of wheels. Um, but you know th this year, um, fortunate enough to just have much better support now. And so, you know, I have, this season I'm building up three bikes, you know, identical bikes, and 
for the team, we have 10 pairs of wheels for two riders and, huh. and, uh, you know, even some old wheels on top of that that we, you know, we prefer not to use, but they're there if we need them. I mean, I guess it's like, it, you know, you see the, uh, a tour de France or whatever, and there's all the cars with the support wheels and the sport bikes, obviously. It's like that, but stationary. It's but yep. stationary, oh, yeah. 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 I never really just thought about it at a, at a cross race. That's interesting. So when you're, so do you holler at the mechanic, next lap I'm getting different wheels, or how do you guys time Yeah, I just that? tell them, you know, put, put the mud tires on. Okay. Um, you know, very, very, very seldom, but sometimes you'll want to change pressure. Like one time I remember, you know, it starts raining in the middle of the race. So, you know, you either switch treads or you say, you know, down, down three PSI or Got it. something like that. Interesting. Well, so you then qualify for Worlds. Mm-hmm. And you went to Worlds in February of this year. Mm-hmm. And talk about the, the sort of the atmosphere of going from a Nationals in Lakewood, Washington to Worlds. What's, it, what's the compare and contrast, those two arenas? Well, uh, I like racing cross in Europe because you, uh, it's such a big deal there. Right. You know, you, you feel like a real professional. And, you know, it's going from kind of this this local fun weekend thing, you know, obviously nationals is a bit more than that, but it goes from that to, you know, you, you feel like maybe a college football player would here. And, you know, it's kind of the same, the same number of fans, the same kind of atmosphere where there's, there's, there's a lot of focus on the event, but it's also kind of like a festival atmosphere, a lot of people partying, drinking. And so there's that, um, it's also just, it's pretty serious, you know, traveling with, with USA Cycling. It's nice to have, um, you know, all of their mechanics and staff on hand. Um, and, you know, it, it's nice. It's just nice to have those resources. It takes the stress off a bit. Right. Um, you know, when, when we're traveling the States, it's pretty much just me, you know, my, my teammate, uh, you know, one or two teammates, maybe, uh, my coach and, you know, sometimes a mechanic, sometimes it's literally just my parents helping out right? or, you know, just, just grant there by himself, um, depending on the race. And so, you know, we, we, while we try to, uh, run a pretty professional team, you know, we don't have a huge budget and we're really doing as much as we can with a pretty small budget. So it's it's a little more bare bones, I would say, here in the States. Um, and then on top of that, just in Europe, the, the level of competition is so much deeper. You know, there, there's a lot of faster riders, but, but other than that, there's just, you're fighting for every single position. You know, at Nationals, I'm riding half the race by myself. Maybe I ride a lot of the race in Europe by myself too. But there's always somebody that you maybe could catch or somebody that's definitely catching you if you slow down a little bit. Yeah. So it's just, it's just a really high level. Sounds like when I went over to play soccer one time and I felt like the other team had twice as many players because they were just so tactically strong and their, their strategy was so good and it was incredible. Is that the same case maybe in cycling too? Do they have different mentality? Do they have just sort of this years and years of strategy that's built into how they race? I think so. I think there's, you know, maybe a little bit more opportunity or just you you learn more racing in Europe because the level is higher. I think there's, it's also just a different process of selection for the best riders. You know, it's, there's so many more people that get into it there because it's a more popular sport. And so naturally there's just going to be, more riders who are better and it's you know it's harder to make it as you know somebody of a certain ability do you aspire or want to go to europe to do race full-time from there yeah that's that is my plan for the next two to three years is to probably move to europe if not full-time you know six or eight months out of the year at yeah. least. Where would you, where would that's, be the, that's really the only way you can make a career bike racing. Where would you go? What would be the sort of ultimate place to land in Europe? Well, for cyclocross, um, 
it's obviously Belgium or the Netherlands. That's right. just where all the races are. Yeah. Um, I probably wouldn't like to live there year round. You know, I speak Spanish, and so Spain is a natural choice. Um, nicer weather. Um, quite a lot of American pros live there, so that that's probably my first choice. Do you also have a similar love of doing crits and road racing? How would how do they all play together in your view? vision of your future as a pro cyclist oh yeah I mean I, I like to do it all and so cross and road have always been kind of equals for me and you know at this point uh, trying to be a professional cyclist I accept that the money is really in road I want to do keep doing cross as long as I can and you know maybe my whole career but I do accept that you know maybe this season now becomes two months rather than five or, hmm. you know, I, I race road all summer and then, you know, maybe I don't have a separate cross team. I just ride the same, the same bikes as the road team or something like that. And so while I, you know, I kind of love both equally, you, know, you got to be realistic about it. Sounds like your heart's a little bit more into cross, just a tad. Um, no, no? I, okay. I disagree. Okay. Um... I just know that if I am, if I had to give up one, not not because it's what what I want to do, but just because the reality of the situation, it it would be cross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a tough. It's probably tough either way to make a living in cycling. There's, as I've learned over the years talking to different people, it's a it's a challenging career. Oh sure, but um, you know, if you if you want to talk about people who make a living wage in in cyclocross. You know, there's maybe 50, 50, maybe 25 men in the world who really do it as their full-time job. And, you know, and compare that to hundreds of riders in the world, you know, several hundred riders in the world tour or, you know, m you know, many more in the, in the pro Conti uh, teams who are making decent money. Decent money, sure. So what's, what's your strategy for trying to get to that next level, if you will, and, and, and actually make that kind of living as, a, as an athlete? What are you focusing on to get better? Well, for cyclocross and road, it's, it's two completely different approaches. For cyclocross, um, basically just trying to build my team up. We would like to bring on a couple um, new younger riders and to just build our team presence to the point where we're able to get more sponsorship money and you know of course I'm training for cross all the time but there's just not really you know much more that I can do results wise that's gonna just automatically bring in a ton of money and so contrast that with the road next year I'm riding for a bolo again and that'll be my last year with the team uh, just due to, due to the age restriction on the team right and so I'm, I'm already done with U23. And so next year is going to be, you know, a, a huge year. It's, you know, I just need, going to need to get the best results that I can and reach out to teams, um, probably mostly European teams, and just try to get that next contract for, for 2022. So what does that mean from a, uh, an athletic standpoint? Like... You do you need to work on this type of fitness or this kind of strength or what is the strategy for your body to to be really attractive to these teams? Well, I mean, re results are kind of the end all be all, right? Right. But um, sort of the the tactic to achieve those. Probably the biggest thing is just I'm continuously adding more volume to the training because. When I was younger, I really, really did not ride that many hours. And to be a professional, you know, that, that's what you have to do. And so just adding the volume is a huge thing. Um, I do a lot of specific interval work. Um, a lot of, you know, even though I'm an all, I consider myself an all-rounder on the road, I do a lot of sprint work, a lot of VO2, and, and, and of course, longer efforts. But... You know, I do strength workouts in the gym twice a week, 
and you know that, that's not just like core and stuff that's like real weights um and a little bit a little bit heavier a little bit more serious in the off season but um pretty much that's year round that's always tricky though isn't it building building weight without getting heavier sort of thing yeah it, it's definitely a balance and you definitely have to you know you want to add a lot of muscle and naturally some fat's going to come with that and then you have to kind of lean off the fat and try and try and preserve a lot of that muscle but really most of most of the gym work I'm doing is not meant to bulk me up at all I'm you know I haven't gained any weight from doing it so that I hard? think that's that's a common is it hard not not a myth but yeah is it hard yeah I mean is it just to kind of one of the hardest things is just you know that's that's always a, a workout where I have another workout the same day so just just you know keeping that keeping that schedule rolling and and keeping the motivation all day is definitely one of the harder parts of that I have a really good strength coach and and he you know we always go back and forth about what my racing schedule is like you know what what my strengths and weaknesses are or you know if I have any pain or injury you know fortunately I haven't had any sort of overuse injury ever but you know he, he's really good in in writing me a program that's, that's specific to cycling and that that makes me better without really overworking me so uh, for, fortunately that's that's been relatively simple I know a lot of I've talked to a lot of pro triathletes um, and they do a lot of massage work and body work and and rest and recovery is super important and I don't know what your volume is compared to maybe an Ironman type of athlete. It might be the same, just different kinds of workouts. But talk about the recovery and the rest and the body work that you do to keep keep on top of it. Oh, sure. So, you know, every, every day after I lift, like immediately after, I'll do a, a long stretching routine, uh, mostly for the lower body, but, you know, a little bit of like spine mobility, that sort of thing as well. And so... You know, I'm pretty much stretching every major muscle in my legs for two minutes at, at least. And so that, that does a lot to just just keep the soreness away and to help me not feel the gym workouts too much later on. Um, you know, obviously when I'm not traveling with the team or anything, massage is pretty expensive, so it's not really something I do regularly. Um, we do have a... Uh, sponsor for our cyclocross team, Todd Plymel Mallory, oh, yeah. and he um, he does some great massage and body work. He also does uh, dry needling, yep. and he's he's really pretty comprehensive in what he does. Um, so I, I'll go to him um, every so often and just you know kind of get kind of get the full body treatment. And he he is excellent at what he does. I've known Todd for a while. Oh yeah, yeah, and. You know, I just do a bit, a bit of foam rolling here and there as yeah. well. Just you know, lighter stretching, um, kind of all the time. Uh, I use like a lacrosse ball on my, on my legs, on my back, that right. sort of thing. Okay. So, what do you? I mean, obviously, you're you're in the bike industry now with Blue. You're racing. What do you love about all of it the most? Um, I just love doing something that I'm interested in all the time and I'm, I'm fortunate to have a job that's it's what I like to do right it's what I know and so not only is it what I learned about in school but it's you know cycling is something I'm super familiar with and you know here at Blue I help I'm helping out with the you know things like the product design or you know going back and forth with magazine editors about, you know, how to work on the bike or something. And so I'm fortunate enough to have the experience in the cycling industry where I can, you know, I know how to build a bike or work on a bike, or I know what qualities I like to have in the bike I'm riding. And so it's, it's cool to be able to put that to use as well. Do you think down the road, do you see yourself as staying in the sort of manufacturing side of the industry? Or do you maybe coaching or what other parts of the industry or I should say the, the sport, do you really like? I have been interested in coaching for a while. I don't know if it's ever going to happen. Um, 
So that's something I definitely am keeping an open mind towards. Uh, you know, I, I like working in the cycling this industry. Sometimes I would like to just get away from the bike world and not, not think about it as much. So it might be nice to do something different as well. I really don't know at this point. What else do you like to do? Um, I, you know, it, it's kind of, it's kind of full of gas in the, in the bike industry all the <laughs> you time. You gotta go out and fish? What, I mean, being so, a Yeah, exactly. I, I, I would just like to take more time to do different things, I guess. I'm, I'm pretty interested in cooking. I'm into clothing. Hmm. Um, but yeah, really, I feel, feel a little bit sometimes like, you know, I'm in the office and, and my boss will have on a race. I'm like, you know, I just like don't want to watch it. I want to like focus on something else for a bit. Right. Well, you're 22. You've got uh, plenty of time to get all the experience in anything you want at this point, which is awesome. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, um, well, I just appreciate spending a few times getting to know you a little better. Are you racing this weekend? At the Thank race? you. Yep. I will be there on, on Saturday out at the local race in Brookfield. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks for your time, and uh, it's good to catch up, and we'll uh, keep on keeping on. Of course. Thanks for having me. All right.